Hey there friends, Nick Lightus Can Am Missing Project. Another copyrighted edition for our video channel. And uh, this time, this is a missing persons video with some letters at the beginning. Some of you still don't get why I read these letters. And I'll say it again. If you find the letters worthless, you probably shouldn't be here. Because I'm not here to entertain you, I'm here to educate you about what's been happening in our world for the last 600 years. Yeah, 600 years. We have cases going back centuries. And until you read the stories that people send in, till I read them to you, it's hard to imagine that these things are happening in our environment. And I suppose decades ago, I might have been a little insulated to some of these things, but I've rapidly caught up. And that's what I'm trying to do for you. So be patient and understand that there's reason to this. One of the things that I, I've done with this channel is bring a diverse format. In the last missing person slot I had, I did an interview with a man who's a really good friend, Jim Myers, who's also a Bigfoot researcher. Jim spent a vast majority of his time studying religion, following the Lord. He's a wealth of information to me. And I count on him for a lot of things. He helped me immeasurably when Ben took his life. Ben was, Jim was one of a handful of friends that continually checked on me. And for that, I could, I could never repay him. It's, uh, it's something that helped me at a time of great need. And he didn't need to step up, but he did. And uh, I've done business ventures with Jim and another individual. We put on the Mile High Mystery Conferences in Denver and uh, <clears throat> had a lot of success with that. And when you're in business with somebody versus just being a friend, you learn a lot more about them. And would I do it again? In a minute. Jim and his wife Daphne are two rare breeds. He explained that he was born in the U.S., raised in South Africa, came back to the U.S., worked for an international organization. And somehow or another, found himself studying Bigfoot. Now, why do I tell you all this now? Because the path we all take in life something that's sometimes not understood. I asked Jim in the interview, did you ever think in a million years that you'd be at this position getting interviewed by me about Bigfoot? And he said, never. So some of the people out there that are poo-pooing the idea that maybe Bigfoot's real or some people claim that missing 411 is a conspiracy theory, and all of you out there know it's not because I've never proposed a theory, so that's a real easy answer. But how do you end up in life where you, where you are today? Did you ever think that you would be where you're at now? And I don't care if you're in a homeless camp, if you're a multimillionaire, I don't really care. I'm asking you, could you have predicted your path? Honestly, I couldn't. I couldn't have in a thousand years. I think I'm sitting here talking to you over visual media. There's nothing I ever contemplated. So how did we end up here? Was it God's will? Was it our free will? to do as we want and predict our own path? 
we're going to talk and I'm going to read to you a few very interesting letters that sort of address this. So let's get going. Hey Dave, my husband and I have been picking mushrooms in the same area for over 30 years. We always go on the same patch on a particular mountain. In the fall, up until last November, it had been a fun thing we looked forward to doing. This last time, however, will probably be the last time we will go to that spot. It was an ordinary fall day, not too cold or windy, and no rain. We dressed warm. Though, and, ha and had our reflective vests and hats on so hunters could easily identify us, and not being deer or elk. Reflective vests, bright orange, hat, bright orange. We started into the woods, which are not very thick, and went in different directions as usual. We kept an earshot, if not line of sight. But after about 10 minutes, I simply stopped and stood perfectly still. I got the most chilling feeling of dread. It seems my husband had the same premonition as he was already heading towards me. He said, we need to leave right now. I agreed. We walked as briskly as we could back to our vehicle and then just went home. That's never happened before. But we have heeded our, your warnings about listening to your inner self. We never survived, and we survived whatever it was that might have been lurking there. Keep hammering this home. It's important. Thanks for all you do. Per Huck, pet Huck for me, and I know Ben is right there every episode. Thank you from Oregon. Something that I should probably hammer this home every session that little inner voice, whether it's in your head or in your heart, that tells you to get out from somewhere and you question it, don't. Get out. Um, I've stated before, we probably have senses that we don't understand that maybe were developed, much more developed thousands of years ago. But when we hear that now, heed it as this lady did and get the heck out. Who knows what, what could have been there? Could have been something just like a mountain lion hiding in the bushes waiting to get you. Who knows? New letter. Hey Dave, I'm new to your channel and I'm finding it fascinating. I'm, s I'm a retired mother of one and grandmother of two. Again, I say I'm retired, but I'm really semi-retired and I'm a CPA. I have the urge to write to you and I don't know why. I was a Girl Scout for many years and a Girl Scout leader for 13, and I've always loved the outdoors. I've had many chances to appreciate the wilderness, mostly on canoe trips in Maine and Canada. I've had the opportunity to see bears, moose, and a variety of other creatures firsthand. As a young adult, I belonged the, to the Adirondack Mountain Club and hiked in upstate New York, in the Adirondack Mountains and the Catskills. In 90, I joined a hike in the Shawagunk, called the Gunks, and this is my strange story. The gunks are not very high, two to 3,000 feet, but are historical with old carnage carriage roads and cliffs scattered throughout due to glacial activity in the past. Interestingly enough, the area has always been noted for its huckleberry picking. Ka-ching, somebody's paying attention. Why is that? Because I've stated in many books and many videos here that the number one berry associated with missing people, huckleberries. Now, am I going to stop huckleberry picking because a lot of people disappear? Uh, no. But, guess who's going with me when I go huckleberry picking? Angie and the Huck. One of the reasons we got her was she's going to be with us in our uh, early warning system to what's around there. There were about a dozen to 15 of us hiking this day, and I'd never met anyone in the group before. This wasn't unusual at all, and there were many hikes to choose from and hundreds of members. It was rated a B minus, so nothing too strenuous. About halfway through the hike, we stopped for lunch and to rest. We spread out a bit and were enjoying the scenery. Suddenly, I noticed a wasp following me quite determinedly. I stood up and backed up to get away from it. All of a sudden, the woman sitting across from me stood up and started yelling, Come here, come here right now. I didn't know what was going on with her, but I was concerned, so I stopped and started towards her. 
At that point, someone pushed me from behind. The push was so hard that I almost tripped and I was kind of annoyed. I remember saying, okay, okay. Walked over to her and asked what was going on. Her eyes were big and she was speechless for a bit. She told me that I almost walked off the cliff and that she called me back. She asked me what the heck I was doing and I told her I was just trying to get away from a wasp. She said it looked like someone pushed you, but there was no one there. I told her that someone did push me and she repeated that there was no one there. It didn't really register with me at the time. We got our gear together and finished the hike. The group stopped for dinner at a local spot, as was custom after a hike. She, would, she was sitting across from me at this table and at one point said, I want to talk to you about this afternoon. She asked me, you said that someone pushed you. What do you think that was? I said, I didn't know. It must have been one of you guys. She just stared at me and said, no, there was no one there. About two weeks later, I was driving home from work, thinking about the hike. I suddenly started shaking and had to pull off the, to the shoulder of the road. My braided brain had finally realized what had happened. I always believed that I had a guardian angel. I'd been saved from death many times before, but never quite as dramatically in front of another person. I decided at that point that I was here in this world for a reason and would do my best to try and fulfill my purpose, whatever that was. Honestly, honestly, I had contemplated suicide at one point after a failed marriage, even though I had a young daughter. I'm just ashamed of that now, but I can't deny that it was real. I'm so sorry about Ben and that you've had to live through that horrible experience. The thing is, there's more to being than we are willing as a society and a culture to recognize. There are so many things that go on around us that we don't understand and have no logical explanation. This has no direct bearing on 411 missing cases and I apologize for taking your valuable time, but I felt compelled to tell you my story. I've only told this to one other person in three years. Thanks so much for the work you do. I pray for you and I hope that you're able to find peace in the world. Ben would want that. I have no doubt that you'll be together again. I hope so. Now, that lady said that it may have no relevance on missing 411. I, I have to say that she's incorrect. And for longtime followers of my work, you're going to understand this quickly if you don't already. I've talked about countless times people have fallen off mountains, cliffs, trails. I've given you many examples of this over the years. And search and rescue can't explain how they fell and injured themselves in that area. Sometimes the hill wasn't that steep but apparently they fell because they had serious injury. Other times I've stated hundreds of times at conferences and meeting people that when I'm alone in the wilderness, I'm very cautious. I'm cautious because I know there's no safety net. It's just me. Yeah, I have my personal locator beacon, which all of you need to be carrying, but I'm alone. Search and rescue is probably at the minimum six to 12 hours away if I get hurt. And I hear about, and I've read about hundreds of cases where everyone just writes it off that they fell. This person fell and died. They, they somehow walked off the trail into this cliff. Now the story that I just read there were two witnesses to it. There was the victim who was pushed and a witness who watched it. This doesn't happen very often. And this is an important incident because there is very little in the way of validation 
of my thoughts on why so many people fall to their death in the wilderness. And again, I've told you of stories or even the search and rescue people can't explain how this person died because the hillside they were on wasn't steep enough to fall and kill you. But somehow the person fell and died. So, thanks for that. Next letter. First, thanks for all the wonderful research you have done and all the time and effort this represents. I'm sure you've probably heard everything of what I'm about to suggest is probably nothing new, but here goes anyway. I believe what we're dealing with here is ultra-dimensional. Let me illustrate this with an analogy. A fish, we'll call him Joe, lives in a pond with his friends and family. The pond is all Joe knows. The water is Joe's dimension. Joe knows nothing about the sky and the earth and trees and mountains that exist beyond the dimension of his pond. He has no way to move beyond the dimension of his pond. One day, Joe is swimming along with his buddies and suddenly he disappears. There's a slight disturbance in the pond water and ripples on the surface. There are no traces. These disappearances have been documented from time to time by the fish people. They note that they often occur in shallow areas of the pond near the shore, although they really don't understand the concept of shore. What has happened? Of course we know Joe has been snatched out of his dimension by a fisherman's net. Sometimes the fish is gone forever. Sometimes it's part of a catch and release program and he's returned to the pond but in a location remote to his initial disappearance and not in the exact spot. Often Joe will have scratches and injuries. If Joe could wear boots and a backpack, they might be tossed back into the pond as well, but in a different location. This making sense to anybody out there? Joe's friends ask him, what happened? Where'd you go? Joe has difficulty explaining his experience for one thing. Joe doesn't understand the new dimension that he found himself in, so he has problems describing it. While he is in this dimension, he has difficulty breathing because he's out of the water, so the brain function is impaired and his reasoning and memory of the event is distorted. And so these disappearances remain a mystery to Joe and his fish friends. I believe there exists at least one, most likely multiple dimensions, that exist just outside our grasp of understanding and ability to detect with our five senses. Something we can sense is their presence, much like the fish might detect the boundary of the pond surface. I believe that to cross these dimensional boundaries requires mastery and control of gravitational forces that we don't yet understand. The entities that exist in these other dimensions have mastered control of gravity, much like we have mastered, to a certain degree, control of electromagnetic forces. These gravitational anomalies that these creatures from these other dimensions create and manipulate cause physical phenomena in our dimension, just as the fisherman's net casts ripples in Joe's pond. Every time a gravitational vortex is opened, it affects the local weather, usually in the form of a sudden drop in pressure or temperature, which results in precipitation and sudden inexplicable storms. These entities may make use of naturally occurring gravitational potentials in densities caused by dense, heavy material like granite and boulders. Or perhaps these boulders cause the vortexes to form naturally and randomly. And the unsuspecting hiker accidentally falls into the other dimension. Imagine Joe swimming up a shallow stream and becoming beached or a drought drying up the pond. I liken this effect to opening a garage door to a larger warehouse. An unlucky bird flies into the warehouse and is bewildered by a dimensional space of which she is unfamiliar. Then the garage door is closed and the bird is trapped. The gravitational anomaly also explains the strange missing time that many of your missing 411 victims describe. We know that strong gravitational forces can slow down time. So while they are in another dimension, time passes slower for them. They only experience a few hours a day not the weeks, months that other searchers experience. And now I will go out on the final limb. Why so often in or around national parks? I believe that these areas were designated as national parks not to preserve the beauty 
of resources of these areas. Not because certain people have known all along that these areas contain or facilitate the creation of portals or vortices into other dimensions. By designating these areas as national parks, it confuses the investigation of these strange disappearances. Who really has jurisdiction? And the fear it creates keeps all but the most inquisitive at bay. Beware, not only are these parks full of dangerous wild animals, but they also are a host of many strange and unexplained disappearances. So these conveniently limits the amount of visitors to the most remote sites and keeps the majority of the well-defined paths. So my questions are, what secrets are being hidden in these national parks and by whom? Could these secrets possibly lead to new understandings of physics and to new sources of power generation? Who would stand to benefit from keeping these things secret? I think when you answer that question, you'll find the answer to these disappearances and much, much more. Very possible. Now, I'd like to make it clear that I do not believe that the people you see at these national parks have any understanding of what we're talking about right here. There might be a few scattered individuals and a few national parks that do understand missing 411. The majority do not. And I would probably hesitate to say that the vast majority of national parks employees don't believe anything unusual is happening there. It's hard to work at a location where you don't believe the administration is being truthful and there might be something in the park that's scary even more scary than a grizzly bear. So working under that theory, most of the park employees don't have a clue. Now in every part of our government, there's a director, the director of the national parks, secretary of the Department of the Interior, secretary of health and human resources, secretary of defense, all of those secretary positions are temporary. None are permanent. There are appointed positions, appointed by politics. Now, in a organization like the National Park Service, and they get a new National Parks Director appointed by the Department of the Interior Secretary, those people now it's just a matter of time and this one will be gone too and I'll still be here and what I mean by that is the lifelong government employee in management as long as they toe the line as long as they basically do what they want to do what their job description says to do they can't get fired just mind your manners the funny part about all that is, I've heard, I've heard from countless National Park people about this. When they look at that new appointee, they don't tell them anything. Because they know that that person will be out of their job soon and will be flapping their gums to the public if they tell them anything really super secret. So they don't. It's those lifelong National Park employees at these parks that know. And they have a mentality that that is their park and you are merely a part-time visitor that'll pay for entry to something that we've already paid for. You'll pay for entry and you'll abide by their rules in their park. Unfortunately, that's the way of the world. Now, for an interesting story. A couple weeks ago, when Jim Myers and, and Daphne were up here, we, we knew they were coming months ago, so we got a National Park pass, three-day pass for Glacier, so we could take them and show them the most beautiful park in North America. And so that day we started out early, and we drove into the east side of Glacier. We tried to get in. And a National Parks Ranger stops us. Where are you going? Oh, we want to go into the park, 
She says, can't let you in. We've reached our capacity. And Dave, in his infinite wisdom, thinking I'm speaking English, they must be listening to Spanish, stated again, no, we went in to your website and we got a special pass for three days. And she said, well, unfortunately, when we reach our daily maximum, we cut it off whether you have a pass or not. Our government is so obscenely wrong on many levels. We purchased a pass to go into that park during this time span. And they are now telling us through their incompetence that they don't have room anymore inside that park for the people that paid the extra money to go in for the people that came out of state to visit on this particular day. What is the point in the pass? Well, yeah, it drives more revenue for the National Park Service. But can you imagine how, how wrong this scenario is? Imagine if you bought a movie pass and that was your seat and you're supposed to show up at 7 p.m. to watch this movie. And you show up at 7 p.m. and the movie theater says, oh, I'm sorry. We don't have room in the theater for you anymore. Oh, no, no, I have the reservation and I paid for the seat. No, 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 we're not letting you in. And you're not getting a refund. How long would that fly in the business world? Well, I'd start with filing a better business complaint. Then I'd contact the theater management. Then I'd contact the newspaper. But when you live in a community where I do, where the national park system has a huge influx of dollars and cents to the local community, the newspapers around here seem to be bought and paid for. I rarely, if ever, see anything in the paper that talks detrimentally about the national parks. And I'm not looking for it, folks. But damn, if I bought a special pass to go into that park, and I've got friends with me in the back seat that came from another state just to see it today, and you're telling me I can't get in? It's not me that's wrong. The system is broken. Yeah, I'm mad about it. I'm still very mad about it. The pass wasn't expensive. The, pass, the point is we went into the system and there was nothing in that system when we purchased it that said, well, the pass may not be good if the park is full. No, it never says that. The whole point behind the pass is to get into the park and they're gonna restrict the number of passes sold so people can get in. <laughs> okay, before my head explodes. Next letter. Hey Dave, I'm a 28-year-old black male. I'm young and think differently than others. First off, I'm a mama's boy. I lost my best friend, my mom, in 2019. And I was lost, still am, so I know your pain is not in the same way, of course, but trust me, I know what it feels like to lose a piece of my world. And it's a consistent struggle, but for example, God or whoever gives the toughest assignments to the toughest leaders, that's my opinion. I love you, man never had a dad and you show me what it's being a man is is all about even through a screen thank you brother okay under my thoughts in theories it's proven throughout all of life that lesser beings think on whatever scale they're on in the universe like for example butterflies they're beautiful but at the end of the day it thinks like a butterfly which can't outthink humans so with that being said, all over the world, we think like humans on a day-to-day -day level, no matter what scenario we will, think like dumb, egotistical humans. We are the only way to get greater understanding is to critically think and take our heads out of our boop, 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 and think outside the box. Correct. A little story. 
It's interesting he brought up butterflies. When I was fishing with Jim last week, they're on this creek and a river, and butterflies were out in mass. They're beautiful. And they would fly around you, and we'd be standing on the sand, and there'd be clumps of 10 or 12 of them all on the sand. And the areas we were in, they're not afraid of people. I could walk, I, I did walk right over to this group and the butterfly was slowly opening their wings and closing. There's like eight or 10 of them. And I just gently, very gently, just touched the side of the wing, didn't fly away, continued just flexing its wings. It's a moment. And I actually was thinking, well, what could this butterfly Think of what, what's happening right now. This huge thing walks up and starts stroking its wings. It doesn't want to harm it. It wants to enjoy its beauty. So, this is timely. Okay, sorry to on to my theory. It's a thing called natural law that everything in our experience is bound by matter, science, and technology. It has to stay, in, it has to stay inside of pre-written laws that we can't fight or win because Mother Nature always will win and will continue to win until we think we are creating a better world with new tech. But in reality, everything is copied in some way or another from the human body. Our bodies are so advanced that they try to mimic from a car, phone, computer. Everything is a copy from the awesomeness that the human is that's natural, the ether. It's not an empty void, but a system of energy, natural energy. A lemon will always produce electricity. A potato can, can cut out a light bulb, pure energy, natural energy. Natural law always with positive, natural, negative energy can't be created or destroyed. Thank you so much. I'm sorry for the long message, but I had to get it off my heart. Well, thank you for the note. I appreciated it. The butterfly analogy reminded me of my trips. That was good. So the next letter is from a newspaper reporter who actually digs. I've communicated with this person many times in the past. A really good guy. Hey Dave, we humans think we're at the top of the food chain and as far as we know, we are. Just like other species probably think they are at the top of their food chain. Birds feed on insects and worms. They're at their perceived top of that food chain. Ants and cockroaches probably feel the same way. When ants and cockroaches venture into human households to get them, they are just exploring or taking a day trip into the wilds, not realizing that they are actually encroaching into what we perceive as our home. And they are not welcome. And we are seen as an intrusion or infestation. So as they appear, they cross a psychological threshold where the homeowner decides to kill the individual insect and or take action like laying traps to kill even more. Further traps involving poisons that eliminate the nest are used. This has at least a couple of ramifications when thinking about missing 411 and Skinwalker Ranch. First, if we think about our ventures into the wild as ants and cockroaches venture into our homes, things that exist out of our perpetual abilities and understanding might not want us intruding into their homes. And then an irritating ant or human frustrates them, they may swat them away, missing 411 case. Second, we have an ant and roach traps that claim to get rid of the colony. So as ant roach gets that poison food, and then they bring it back to the colony, thus eliminating the colony. What if the events at Skinwalker Ranch are similar to that? Think about it. These are pests at a place of greater beings doesn't want pests at all. So the pests bring back pest control when they leave. This might explain the function of the hitchhiker phenomenon concerning the ranch. The people at a site take home pest control. What does this mean? We might be nothing more than ants or cockroaches encroaching into an area where we're not welcome. Some measure of pest control might be implemented in controlling our intrusion into an area where we have no idea that we're not welcome. Just like ants and cockroaches have no idea, they are not welcomed into our homes. Brilliant. Well said. And who can say if it's 
true or not true. Uh, quick story. A while back, I read you a great story about a, a man who sent in Man, I was trying to find this picture for you and I can't find it. A man who sent in a story about the three iron. And we talked about how it disappeared from the bag. Man was from Arizona. So the first day Jim and Daphne are out with us, we took them into downtown Whitefish and we're walking around like an art fair uh, at the park. So it was a big fair. I'm standing in a booth looking inside with the group and this guy walks up to me and goes, hey, Dave Pilatus. I said, yeah. And he introduces himself and he goes, Dave, I'm the guy who sent you the three iron story. <laughs> Holy cow, that's amazing. And uh, we had a great conversation. He says, yeah, we're just vacationing up here from Arizona and son of a guy, I ran into you. You talk about coincidental. Angie was there, Jim and Daphne were there, and we all stood around and talked for quite a while. And he had some other friends with him that I didn't meet, but I wanted to say that I have not met anyone in a public spectrum like this that wasn't a super nice person. I'd never been attacked, never had somebody come up and just rail on me. They're always really nice people. And I want to thank you for that, because as part of this village, we've kind of set the stage for new people coming in. They read the posts. They see how nice everyone is to each other. And I think that breeds more happiness, congeniality, friendship. And I think this is important. And I want to thank you. Just a brief statement of appreciation. Now, just the other day, someone sent me this case in. Talk about it a little bit at a high scale. Uh, Alzheimer's and dementia. I've stated before that people on different ends of the intellectual scale seem to disappear. And then there's also people with Alzheimer's and dementia that seem to disappear. And if you think about someone who has that, they're later in life, they don't have the stamina of others, and they have no idea where they're going sometimes. So for them to completely disappear and not be found is illogical. Because a canine should be able to pick up the track on that person. When they bring in professional trackers, they should be able to find that person. Now this was sent in just the other day and it's still early in the uh, in the whole process. The search is over but I do want people to be aware of this case and it happened in Corinth just outside of Corinth near Glen, Mississippi. So I'll give it to you here. It's a map. This is Glen. The articles all talk about Corinth, but it happened just south of Glen. And this would be the Tennessee Mississippi border, and this is the Alabama Mississippi border. There's a big, big creek right here, a big, big lake over here. Now, the man, Foy Wade Davis, 77 years old went missing June 22nd at 10 a.m. in Alcorn County, Mississippi. He had early dementia and he liked to walk. And every day he would, he would walk in the heat with his pet boxer, that dog. Well, he didn't come back that day. But when he left, the dog was on a choker chain and had a, a metal type leash. 
Well, when Foy didn't come back, search and rescue was called. He was last seen walking north on 300 County Road 343 in Alcorn County, Mississippi. Now this is, this is Foy. If the man looks familiar to you and you're from northern Mississippi, southern Tennessee, call the state police or Alcorn County Sheriff's in Mississippi. Family issued a $5,000 reward for where Foy may be located. Now, careful. And I don't, I don't usually talk about these cases, but this one's fairly new and I'm, I'm concerned about it. I'm not saying that's a 411 case, but I'm saying that there's enough in it that we should be concerned. The sheriff said that uh, they walked 3,000 foot miles with horse teams, drones, helicopters, fixed wing aircraft. And again, that family offered a $5,000 reward trying to figure out where Foy might have went. Again, friends, he didn't contemplate the disappearance. He didn't plan on going to another city. This man just vanished. And it doesn't make any sense because he was aged and it, this is a super rural area of Mississippi. This area down in here where he disappeared south of Glen, this is really, really thick, thick vegetation and nobody's going to walk through it for a long time. That's why not being found just doesn't make sense. doesn't make any sense to me. Sorry. And that's why we're talking about it today. So first case I'm going to talk to you about is Walter Hay. Now, Walter, no age given by Walter by the news on, on Walter. But he disappeared December 23rd, 1912, 30 miles north of Mount Rainier National Park. That's within the cluster zone of Mount Rainier. And there have been a lot of people that have disappeared within that cluster. He lived in Taylor, Washington. And it's an extinct city south of Kings County, Washington. Walter always carried a compass. He was going cougar hunting. Now, the way you hunt mountain lions, cougars, is you use dogs. Walter had two dogs. And he went into the woods, and there was a small cabin that he was going to stay at that he told people that was a friend's. And he went in there, and somehow or another, he killed a pheasant on the way in. And that first night, he ate the pheasant, but he brought with him provisions for two days. Well, he was supposed to be back to the house December 24th, between 4 and 6 p.m. He never came back. So on December 25th, the family called search and rescue. On December 26th, the dogs, his two dogs that he took with him, Cougar hunting returned, uninjured. Now I should also tell you on the previous story that Foy's, Foy's dog came back too. Two incidents where dogs came back. In Mr. Foy's case, the dog came back without the collar, without the leash. How'd that happen? So in this case, Mr. Hayes' dog, both of them came back uninjured. And Search and Rescue tried to get the dogs to go out with them to see if they would search. And they tried multiple times. Now, for people who don't know about mountain lion hunting, hunters use dogs. Dogs get on the trail of the mountain lion, sniff it out. And they chase the mountain lion until the mountain lion goes up a tree. And then the dogs stay at the bottom of the tree, barking and growling. And nowadays, 
they have the hunter will put GPS on the dogs and they carry a little screen and they can tell where their dogs are at and then they follow and go to the dogs wherever they are in the forest. They always lose the dogs until they can find them on their GPS and track them. And then they go to the tree, they see a cougar in the tree and they shoot the cougar. I don't think it's very sporting, but that's just me. I wouldn't do it, but that's just me. There's a lot of guys who, and women who enjoy that kind of hunting. I'm not going to pass judgment, but it's just me. Now that's what Walter was doing. He had two dogs and went into the woods to go mountain lion hunting. So his son shows up with the dogs and twice they go into the woods. They can't get the dogs to track past the point of where he stayed in the house. Now that first night that he stayed in the house, a big storm moved in and dumped a lot of snow. And search and rescue said that they didn't find any tracks in that area leaving the cabin under the presumption that the storm covered everything up. Now after the snow settled, two mountaineers, really experienced outdoorsmen, left that cabin and hiked on foot to Issaquah, thinking that was the direction that Walter would have went. They found nothing. So they didn't find any tracks. The dogs of his that they brought into the woods had no interest. Weather, it snowed. Subgroup, hunters, and we're in a cluster zone. Now the thing about this case that's really interesting to me is that he took two dogs and both dogs returned. And both dogs showed no interest in going back out. Hard for me to understand that. Mostly dogs are super loyal to their masters and would stay with that person even after death. And I've heard of search and rescue people walking up on a body and the dog sitting next to the master dead. I've heard about that many times. But in this case, dogs were no way going back into those woods. So that was Walter Hay, 1223-1912. Why is this important? Because these disappearances were happening, happening around Mount Rainier 108, nine years ago, 10 years ago. Important historical perspective. Now, The next case involves an incident regarding R.J. Curley Hall, missing July 18, 1935. They, he and two friends established a camp between eight and 9,000 feet. They were prospectors from Yale, British Columbia. The location of this was a place called Old Settler Mountain. And Old Settler was in an area northeast of Hope, British Columbia. Here's the map. So here's Hope. This is the search area out here near these peaks. Lots and lots and lots of water out here. So they're searching and he didn't come back that night. So his other two friends went out looking for him, couldn't find him. And the two friends were George Reeves and Frank Burton. Longtime prospectors, long time working together as a team. Finally, they decided they needed to hike out and it was a long hike, a couple days. And they got back into Hope and they told the RCMP about what happened. And Ray Baker, was the RCMP corporal, and he and a sergeant named King organized a search group to go back into the zone. RCMP stated that they thought that Curly Hall would be okay, possibly, because there was a large crop of fresh berries in the area where he vanished. 
So the searchers and the tracker, which from were two trackers from Native American tribes in the area, First Nations tribes, went in. I've stated before, I will state it again, the Native American and First Nation trackers are the best in the world. If somebody had been through an area, they're going to find it. They're going to find the track. 99 times out of 100, they're going to find the person. Well, they returned to an old settler with five search and rescue and two trackers. And they stayed there for a week. And they didn't find anything. So, when you got trackers like that, that don't find any tracks, and RJ was never found, and he was missing in a cluster zone in British Columbia, suspicious to say the least. He disappeared in an area near or above Timberline. Not a lot of places to hide up there. So where did he go? What happened to him? None of it made any sense. Yeah, none of it made any sense. So, next case. Roger Kirch, missing November 4th, 1979, 4 p.m. He was only 15 years old. In the Norse Peak Wilderness, near an area called Crow Lake. Again, <laughs> very, very near Mount Rainier National Park. And I'll show you on the diagram. Here's Mount Rainier. There's Crow Lake. Not very far at all. So, Roger was hunting with friends. And he was six miles northeast of Crystal Mountain Ski Area. In the ski area. Right here on the map. Six miles northeast. And he lived in Issaquah and attended Issaquah High School. He had a brother and two sisters. He, he lived with his mom. His dad lived in another city. He left the camping and hunting party and walked off to hunt alone, point of separation. He failed to return the night of November 4th, 1979. On November 5th, very early in the morning, the friends left and contacted the sheriff in Yakima County and told him what happened. The sheriff sent a large contingent of search and rescue personnel into the region. And the first day of the search and rescue, it snowed. Well, the SAR was extended out to six days and then termed at the end of the sixth day because they weren't finding anything. They had a memorial service for Roger because he was a religious kid at a Baptist church in Issaquah. This is well within the cluster zone of Mount Rainier. He was a hunter and weather compromised. Plus, he was in an area with lots of water, a lake and creek and rivers, and there was point of separation. You can't ignore this stuff. And I am as equally dumbfounded every time I research this, how I see the points that I'm bringing out. Not too long ago, I was talking to someone in the law enforcement arena and it was a friend I talked to occasionally. But I didn't know that he took such a keen interest in my work. And he said, Dave, you know when you talk about a lot of these cases in big searches, an FBI agent and his partner show up. And they say, we're not here to help. We're just here to monitor the case. I said, yeah. And he says, what do you think is going on with that? I said, I, th I think they understand what we do that something unusual is at play and they're documenting this and they're sending it to their profiling unit and they're profiling the cases just like we are here. He goes, yeah, that's exactly what I was thinking. And he goes, that's my buddy. He goes, 
You know, on one of these online venues, somebody was attacking you because you cherry pick the cases. He said, Dave, do you know how insane that guy sounded? I go, oh yeah, but he's right. And he goes, I know, but he's trying to make you look like a bad guy because you're cherry picking cases. <laughs> I can't help the intellect. Now, when I cherry pick cases, it means that I go out and I look for the cases that have these different profile points. And then I put them together in a book and I give them to you. Or I give them to you in a video here. So am I cherry picking? Yes. <laughs> and the guy wants to make me be a bad guy about that. He has no idea what he's talking about. And this is the obscene part of online video at YouTube. People can attack others. People can make fun of others. People can say how stupid I am. People can say, oh, these cases, nothing more than somebody just got lost. Until you look at the numbers. Until you're overwhelmed by the numbers. And you start to see the similarities. And friends, I know you do. And I know a lot of my friends do as well. And I know that you law enforcement people out there get it. And I know that you national park rangers that talk to me get it. I understand that. So, that was four cases. Four missing person cases today. And uh, I tried to, try to give you that gap of knowledge. And I think the letters this week really went to the point of what I was trying to make. And I, and I hope you guys got it. If you didn't, Maybe I'm not being clear enough, or maybe I'd have pound home points even harder. Anyway, thanks for being here. Please share on your social media all these videos. I'd really appreciate it. We're in the heart of summer right now. People need to know to contact somebody before they go into the wilderness. Tell them the date you're going to be out. And if you're not out, they're going to call search and rescue. Tell them you need to carry a personal locator beacon, which you can research on Amazon, read the reviews, make a buying decision on your own. You don't need a personal locator beacon that charges a monthly fee. You don't need that. But if you want that, you can. Somebody could monitor your progress online with those. But thanks. I'm greatly appreciated. appreciative that you're here. I'm humbled that anybody wants to watch. So we'll keep plodding away. You have a safe summer. Be nice to somebody today. I was at the store today. I held the door open for someone. This older lady looked at me like I was her best friend and said, thank you. Made my day. You can do the same thing. It'll make your day. Oh, by the way, Huck says hi. <laughs> She's either in the other room playing, but I'll have her on soon. Have a great day. Politis out.